In this video, we're going to look at the convex concave rule and apply that to the glenohumeral joint. It's important to know the arthrokinematics of each joint uh, so that when you are treating a patient and they have limitations in joint movement, you can determine whether or not the arthrokinematics are faulty and if so, how they're faulty and how you might remedy that. So first let's look at the convex concave rule. The convex concave rule states that when the, you have a concave joint surface and a convex joint surface, uh, depending on which one is moving on the other one, uh, the roll and the slide will either occur in the same direction as each other or in the opposite direction as each other. So let's look at that a minute. Here we have your concave joint surface, that is it's hollowed out like a cave. Here we have your convex joint surface, that is it's rounded like a ball. Okay. <clears throat> the convex concave rule tells us that when this convex joint surface moves on the concave joint surface, and let's say this is the bone that's attached to that convex joint surface, kind of like the humerus, the roll and the slide that the convex joint surface will do on the concave surface will occur in opposite directions. The roll and the slide will be opposite each other. So let's look at what that means. If this bone here moves in an upward or superior direction, you have this sort of movement, okay? In what I just did, the slide and the roll occurred at the same time, but it can be helpful to uh, look at them separately. If I don't let the joint surfaces slide on each other so that there's only a roll, you'll see this sort of a motion. So that the convex joint surface actually rolls out of that convex joint surface altogether. And you can see the roll occurs in a superior direction. In order to keep those joint surfaces mated, there is a counteracting slide that occurs in the opposite direction. When you put them together, they look like this. All right? But this movement consists of a superior roll and an inferior slide. That's important to know, and throughout the course, you'll be expected to uh, know and understand all the arthrokinematics for each joint that we look at. So that's half of the convex concave rule. Let's look at the other half. The other half looks at what happens when a concave joint surface moves on a convex joint surface. So now we have this blue concave joint surface and the bone is attached to moving on this convex joint surface. When you have a concave moving on a convex surface, the roll and the slide occur in the same direction. So let's look at what that looks like. If this blue bone and joint were to move in an upward direction, like that, let's say, you have the roll occurring in an upward direction as well, and you also have a slide that occurs in the upward direction. If you put this roll and this slide together, what it looks like is this. Okay? But this motion of the convex surface on the con or I'm sorry, of the concave surface on the convex surface comprise, uh, is comprised of two things: a roll in a superior direction and also a slide in a superior direction. When you put that roll and the slide together, it looks like that. And the roll and the slide occur in the same direction when the concave surface is moving on the convex surface. So let's apply this to the glenohumeral joint. In the glenohumeral joint, there's a lot of different emotions that can occur. Let's first look simply at abduction. Okay. So now we have a glenoid fossa and a humeral head okay, attached to a humerus right here. When I abduct my arm, what do we have? We have the humeral head moving on the glenoid fossa, a convex surface moving on a concave surface. 
As that happens, you have this sort of a motion. If you take that roll on the slide and divide them out or separate them out, what you have is a superior roll with a counteracting inferior slide to keep the humeral head centered in the glenoid fossa. And it looks like that. With a deduction, just the opposite happens. Now we're starting up here. We have an inferior roll and a counteracting superior slide to keep the head of the humerus in the glenoid fossa. Put them together, it looks like this. Separate them out, you have the roll with the counteracting slide in the other direction so that it stays uh, in the glenoid fossa we're exposed to. Let's look at internal and external rotation. With internal and external rotation with the shoulder adducted and arm at the side, external rotation, internal rotation, okay? Let's look at external rotation first. So from here to here, external rotation. Now we have the humeral head and the glenoid fossa, all right? And external rotation means the head of the humerus actually rolls posterior on the glenoid fossa with an anterior slide to keep it in the fossa, all right? So that external rotation motion is cons consists of a posterior roll and an anterior slide. Put them together, it looks like that. Internal rotation from here to here by the, with the arm adducted to the side. Internal rotation starts here and then rotate internally, okay? That internal rotation consists of a anterior roll with a counteracting posterior slide to keep it in the pocket, all right? So an anterior roll with a posterior slide to keep the head of the humerus seated in the glenoid fossa. Put that all together and it just looks like this, okay? Um, let's look at shoulder flexion then, okay? Shoulder flexion, straight up in front, just like that, okay? Shoulder flexion and extension actually have the same arthrokinematics in opposite directions, but the same arthrokinematics. With shoulder flexion, you don't have a roll or a slide all that much. What you have is this sort of a thing, okay? And that's not a roll or a slide, that's simply a spin. The head of the humerus simply spins around one point in the glenoid fossa. So for flexion and extension, the humeral head is simply spinning around an axis in the glenoid fossa. Similar to that is internal and external rotation when the arm is abducted to 90 degrees. Now we have internal rotation, external rotation. Similarly, here's the humerus or the humeral head, glenoid fossa. When you have internal and external rotation with the shoulder abducted to 90 degrees, again, it's just a spin. The head of the humerus simply rotates around a point spinning in the glenoid fossa. So there's a point on the top here that it simply rotates around and that is a spin. Okay, the other movements that we need to look at would be horizontal adduction. Okay, for horizontal adduction, we have an anterior roll with a posterior slide to keep the humeral head, again, seated in the glenoid fossa. So put them together, it looks like this. Okay, but if you were to separate them out, you'd have an anterior roll with a posterior slide to keep it seated uh, in the glenoid fossa. With horizontal abduction, abduction, it's just the opposite. You have a posterior roll with an anterior slide to keep the head of the humerus, again, centered in the glenoid fossa. Put them together, it simply looks like this. Separate them out, you have that posterior roll 
with an anterior slide. Okay? With all of these movements, you can figure them out yourself, even though you may not have a thermoplastic convex and concave joint member. You can use your hands. Here's your concave joint member. Here's your convex joint member. So if you're in a quiz or in an exam or with a patient, you can just simply say, okay, here's my glenoid fossa. Here's my head of the humerus. If I'm doing abduction, abduction, say, I have a superior roll and an inferior slide to keep my head of my humerus centered in my glenoid fossa. So you can always have your own concave and convex joint member handy to figure out and understand the arthrokinematics of any particular joint. These are pretty much always on the quizzes and always on the exams. Arthrokinematics are essential to know, so make sure you understand them. If you understand them, you don't have to memorize them. You can just figure them out each time with your knowledge of the shape of the joint surfaces.